Hello, I'm Shobha Shukla from Citizen News Service. And today we are in conversation with Charles Gore, Executive Director at Medicines Patent Pool, or MPP, as we call it. His brush with the hepatitis C virus around 1995 led him to form the Hepatitis C Trust in the UK in, I think, 2000. He also helped create the European Liver Patients Association and was its first president in 2004. Welcome, Charles. In fact, it was way back around 2005 that we at Citizen News Service first heard about you, Charles, while interviewing someone co-infected with HIV and going through a hepatitis C treatment in Thailand. Your leadership has been very instrumental in drawing the world's attention to this disease. Please reflect on your journey, share with us what were the key learnings and what could have gone better perhaps. Okay, well, thank you very much indeed, uh, Shobha. I'm delighted to be on this program. And uh, yes, I, I guess I'm very flattered that somebody had heard about me in, in 2005. But uh, you mentioned that um, I was involved in the uh, creation of the European Liver Patients Association. And it was when I stepped down from that in, in 2006 that I felt that, that one of my really big failures in that role had been raising awareness. And it was because of that that I... I asked all the patient groups that I knew to send someone from their geographic area to a, a meeting I put together in, in Barcelona to ask if they wanted to do something. And out of that came the decision to create a, a World Hepatitis Day. And I think that um, that led then through the, the uh, establishment of the World Hepatitis Alliance to run that day, which then got involved in much more advocacy work and so on, and ultimately led me to what I'm doing now. Um, I think that if I was going to reflect on, on some of that journey, um, I'd probably say that, that um, one of the key learnings was um, perseverance. But I'd also like to, to say that one of the advantages I had was being extremely naive. So, because I didn't really foresee the problems that there were going to be, I just went ahead and did things anyway. Probably if I'd been smarter and had realized how difficult it was going to be, I'd never have done it. Um, so a certain amount of naivety, possibly even stupidity, was a great help. But I do think that when I say perseverance, what I'm really talking about is that hepatitis, both hepatitis C and B, has been extraordinarily neglected. And it has also always seemed to run up against um, um, one challenge after another. So when we were trying to create World Hepatitis Day, uh, one of the first things that people said was, oh, we don't want another day. And I was told, you're never going to be able to get this through, getting 193 countries to agree to this. But as I said, you know, just by perseverance, somehow we did. And then once that was set up, trying to get countries to take action, and they said, oh, I'm sorry, we're, we're now moving away from wanting to do disease-specific programs. Uh, we're much more interested in health system strengthening. And then even when we managed to kind of push that with great help, for example, from hepatitis C in terms of the development of these new drugs, um, there was another issue, which was, oh, we maybe want to do less in infectious diseases. Now the big thing is non-communicable diseases. And then even when we managed to get uh, elimination onto the agenda, suddenly every disease has an elimination program now um and if you say what could have gone better um well <laughs> when we originally set up world hepatitis day we set it up in may which is a much more convenient month than where it is now and it was the countries who at the last minute decided that may wasn't so good 
because they were like at the World Health Assembly and so decided to put it bang in the middle of uh, the year, July 28th. For the, the Northern Hemisphere, it's right in the middle of uh, uh, summer holiday. And actually for a lot of Southern Hemisphere, they are also, it's in the middle of their break. Very few parliaments are sitting during that time. So it's difficult to get um, political action. And of course, one of the major problems for hepatitis has been around funding. And um, very little funding at World Health Organization, for example. So, um, you know, when, when we started, there wasn't a single person out of the 8,000 people working in the whole of the World Health Organization with hepatitis in their job title. As a result of, of the various resolutions, primarily the first one, WHO set up a global hepatitis program, which is a nice title. It sounds like it's this huge program. It's basically about three people because they've not had funding for it. And in fact, at the, the World Hepatitis Alliance, we, have, we ended up funding some posts in WHO um, in the regions, focal points in the regions. So I still think that funding is something that maybe we could have done more advocacy around. Um, and I also think that um, my aim personally was always to get hepatitis recognized alongside malaria, TB and HIV in the, in the infectious diseases space. And we almost got there, but just not quite. So um, I think it upset me a little bit that um, in the uh, Sustainable Development Goals, it talks about uh, ending the epidemic of, of HIV and, and TB and malaria, but, but only combating hepatitis. So, admittedly, there's now an elimination uh, resolution, but, you know, still, I don't think it has the priority, and that certainly shows up in funding. And a paper in The Lancet in, in December, I think, looked at where we would be on current trends in 2040. And it suggested that deaths from viral hepatitis would be greater than deaths from HIV, TB and malaria combined. That's the areas where um, we could have done better. Yeah, but your never say die attitude will make us do better i'm sure of that chance and uh, now let us listen about your recent new avatar as the head of uh, medicines patent pool uh, tell us something about your recent trip to india charles what were the objectives and extent were these achieved uh yes thank you uh shoba so um the, I, I had been um, uh, trying to help uh, the medicines patent pool uh, get a license for um, AbbVie's uh, hepatitis C combination. So I had been in touch with them quite a lot when this um, job um, came up. And although I had no intention of, of stopping what I was doing, which was um, having stepped back from the World Hepatitis Alliance, it was concentrating on trying to make sure of elimination of hepatitis C in the UK with the Hepatitis C Trust. Nonetheless, um, this opportunity at the Medicines Patent Pool was just too important for me to turn down. I felt that we could provide access to so many more people, help so many more people than I could help in the UK. Um, and part of the reason for going to India was to try and make sure that we really capture the impact of what we do when we give licenses to generic manufacturers and then they produce very cheap, high quality versions of, of key drugs. And so we went to uh, talk to the government, heads of programs, uh, doctors, of course, people living with HIV or hepatitis to get their view on what access has meant to them and how important it's been. And uh, we did a lot of filming, a lot of interviewing, and um, we're still in the process of digesting all that. So I can't tell you that we've got the most wonderful footage, but certainly from the interviews that I present at, 
I think it, we really succeeded in doing what we were trying to do. And I hope that this will be a way of, of showing in, in, ter in the human terms, you know, what good access can do. Okay. Why is access to medicine so important? Uh, even though access to essential medicines is still beset with barriers, we'll talk of that a little later on. Why do you think it is important? Well, health is such a critical part of life. And it is, uh, it's interesting because it's the thing that is often undervalued by people until they don't have it anymore. And when you don't have it, you suddenly realize how important it is. And then is, if there is something that you can do about it to correct whatever is wrong, that is really important that you should be able to do that. And it shouldn't matter where you live or how rich you are, you should have access to medicines that are really key, in fact, that are essential for health. And making sure that we can provide that access is something that we all have to do. You know, it isn't just the medicines patent pool. This is a, a global thing. And, and we will never reach the sustainable development goals unless we do this. And ethically, we should not be in a situation where we have a first world and a third world. Everybody should have access to the medicines as soon as possible. And really, when they're available in the US, they should be available in, in developing countries as well. Uh, we find there are a lot many barriers for, to access medicines, right from translational research level to operational, programmatic, structural barriers. Is research and development being informed by the needs of those who are most underserved? If yes, to what extent? I think often that's not the case. Um, mm. And I think that these barriers that you, you point out are um, only too true and only too real. And um, I think they show very clearly that price is only one of them. Mm. And that you can bring the price down, but there's so many other things that can get in the way, whether it's diagnosis or linkage to care or health systems or education that stop people getting access. But in terms of R&D, I mean, R&D is not really our area as such. Um, but it's clear that um, often um, people most in need are not very well served. Um, because they may not always appear to be very interested in commercial markets. Uh, and this is true, for example, in pediatric HIV. And one of the things um, our licenses have managed to do is it allows our generic manufacturers to develop new forms that could be very friendly and that's exactly what's happened in uh, in HIV pediatrics um, and but we we are also keen that that um, there is a commitment uh, particularly with money involved in funding research and development to ensuring that part of the quid pro quo for that investment is a guarantee of access when the drugs are developed uh, so, while access to medicines is so central, even if we have to deliver on SDGs, uh, we think that compulsory licensing flexibilities have been very poorly utilized or underutilized by most governments. Uh, please share your thoughts on this. Is compulsory licensing going to help and how, means how far has it helped? Okay, I mean, the, the compulsory licensing is um, one of a range of, of um, access um, methods, if you like, yes. um, which include voluntary licensing, public health licensing with us, um, price negotiation, and so on. And together they form a range that 
are sometimes suitable in certain circumstances and not in others. Um, and I don't want to comment too much on compulsory licensing because that's just not what we do. But I think that within this range of approaches to access, although what we do at the Medicines Patent Pool with public health licensing, all the advice is an answer. And one of the reasons that it is an answer is because of the features of our licenses, which is that we often have a lot of countries in these licenses, meaning that access is, is available in generally around 100 plus countries. Also, um, we can, through our licenses, provide and do technical support to generic manufacturers because I think there is sometimes a misunderstanding that you give out a license and then the generic manufacturer just pops into their lab and fires out these, these drugs. But in fact, developing a generic version is a lot more complex than that. And so that's part of our license, something that, that we do. Um, we also require our licensees to go through um, quality assurance to make sure that the drugs that they deliver are of very high quality. And as, I, as I've said, we can, uh, the, the, our licenses allow and encourage indeed the development of, of new formulations, for example, for children, but also combinations of drugs from different originated companies. So an example of that is tenofovir, imivudine and uh, dolutegravir, which is currently first line treatment for HIV. At the same time, our licenses uh, go out to a number of generic manufacturers and consequently this creates price competition and helps to really drive down the price to an affordable level and at the same time making sure that there isn't just one supplier and hence uh, potential lack of security around supply. So um, I think, and on top of which I should also add, our, our licenses are up on the on our website, so they're in their entirety, so they're completely transparent, so you can see the terms of them. So as I say, I don't think that, that MPP has the answer to access, but I think along with compulsory licensing, price negotiation and so on, it is part of the answer. Okay. Uh, why do pharmaceutical companies want to work with uh, MPP on voluntary licensing? What's in it for them? Uh, can you help us understand how voluntary licensing can serve better the interests of government and not just of the pharmaceutical companies? Yes, I, I will try. Um, so, uh, first of all, in, in, in terms of um, uh, why pharmaceutical companies uh, want to engage with us, um, Pharmaceutical companies have, are obviously primarily uh, profit-making concerns, but they also care very much about their image. And companies are now uh, often rated by the Access to Medicines Index about how well they are providing access. But on top of that, at uh, and what shedding is part of it that's very profit driven. At the same time, companies, broadly speaking, wants to be used by as many people as possible. So we facilitate, particularly in areas where they might not see much commercial interest, either because at the prices they would like to charge, no one to buy them because the prices are too high, or because they don't, for example, have um, people in that country. Uh, and so for them it can be um, quite um, an easy uh, way of, of, of improving, making more drugs available without, for example, putting a team in place in certain countries. But I also think that there is um, a sort of hidden financial incentive for, for companies. Um, 
companies that have a good reputation tend to find it easier to um, hire people, to retain people. And um, I also think that um, in, the, in the long term, they might find it uh, beneficial in terms of their share price because as investors slowly transition to more ethical investing, they are more likely to invest in a company that has a good access plan, for example, through us, than one that doesn't. And in terms of does this help governments? Well, uh, I guess my first answer to that question is what I really want to do is to help people. Government yes. second. Yes. Right. Um, <laughs> Um, and that's what a, a lot of my last 20 years has been about. Can we get it, these drugs to, to people at a price they can afford? And it may be that the government can afford or that they can afford if they're partly paying for it or if it's coming entirely out of their pocket that they can afford. And I think, you know, we do this by through the methods I've sort of mentioned with uh, competition driving down the price making it available in a huge swathe of, of countries, and in particular in uh, the least developed countries, the countries with the poorest populations. Um, so they are almost always included in our license. And when we're talking at you know, 100 plus, sometimes up to 130 countries in licenses, that sort of governments, a lot of people who have access at a price they can afford. Um, so how are we learning from experiences in rolling out new medicines or tools? Uh, we have so many examples, like uh, I am very passionate about the female condoms, condoms, which were approved by the FDA in 1993 and are yet to translate fully in reducing uh, unintended preg pregnancies, STIs, HIV. PrEP was approved in 2012 by FDA but we are still fi figuring it out, how to roll it out in countries like India. Even the new TB child-friendly formulations and drugs like bedaculine, delaminate are there, but still a lot of years have will perhaps go by when we can have their op optimal access to them. We are still not even using all gene expert machines for detecting drug resistance TB uh, at upfront uh, test at the time of TB diagnosis. So are we capturing these lessons from what we what did not go well and could do better to improve access in future? Um, I think we're not capturing them very well. Um, but you are also asking me to step very much outside my um, field of expertise since, uh, you know, operationalizing uh, a lot of this delivery is a whole different um, area. Mm -hmm. And yes, it's a, it's a big problem. I mean, you know, in my sort of uh, specialist area, if you like, um, hepatitis C, you know, clearly we, we had these revolutionary drugs that cure people um, with licenses. So they're, they're essentially an affordable price. I mean, um, India have just negotiated uh, an amazing price for their new national hepatitis program but scaling up is a whole different thing but we are beginning to see in hepatitis c that you know several years four years after these drugs first came to market programs are starting to to take off as in india and um you know based i think uh, to a degree on what was done in the uh, province of punjab the state of punjab excuse me where um Clearly, it's been shown that this can be done. Scale up is possible, and then it makes sense to to have a national program. Um, and um, a lot of these uh, these issues um, may come up in the new areas into which we're going to expand. Um, so there are a lot of lessons to be learned. But I'm not the. You know what, Shobha, you probably could answer this question much better than I could, to be honest. <laughs> I, I have a personal interest there, Charles. I lost one of my relatives to hepatitis C a few years ago, just because it could not be diagnosed timely. 
when it was eventually diagnosed it was just too late for her to survive so yes. that, that i have that personal angle to this disease that she could not perhaps she could not access the right type of diagnostics the right type of doctor even staying in a place like lucknow where where i am right now which is the capital of uttar pradesh one of the biggest states of india so well yeah. that's it let's hope things are better now but it uh, since we heard about you first in thailand uh, charles is there any specific work of mpp in thailand uh thailand is, is one of the countries included in uh, a lot but not all of our licenses so um yes um it's um thailand's one of those interesting countries where uh, sometimes we can make sure that it's included and sometimes we don't but it's clearly uh, a target country for us to try and include in all our licenses so yes okay and uh, your message for world tb day uh, world hepatitis day is a little too far off but you can give your message for that too <laughs> in any case you say in july uh, is not a very good time to have that day but still if you can give your message for both these days it's not well my message for that is you know as you know ending the tb epidemic by 2030 is a you know one of the the targets in the sustainable development goals mm -hmm. and we have a lot of work to do to ensure that we can do that and we absolutely must not cease for one moment in trying to get there and we desperately need new drugs and we need to make sure the ones we have are properly rolled out this is particularly true for mdr tb so yes i mean i talked at the beginning about perseverance and if there is a single disease area where perseverance is critical it is tb yes okay uh, thank you charles we uh, now open the question and answer session and invite the participants if they want to ask any questions or to give any comments you can click on the q and a box which you are seeing on the screen and then type in your question if you wish to speak you can click on the virtual hand screen uh, we have students which have come in all red is what is future for mp can you see the model developing into other therapeutic uh, areas expanding into other therapeutic areas also uh thank you um so um the world health organization and a number of member states as well as other international organizations have been asking us to to take this model have that currently is applied to hiv tb and, and hepatitis c into other areas and so um uh, a year, but over a year ago we began a, a feasibility study to see if this made sense um that concluded that uh yes it did um there's still quite a lot of elements of this that need to be explored but it's essentially it's said that we should go into medicines on the who's essential medicines list um, or ones that might be included in the future um or ones that would have been included now if perhaps they would be not so expensive and uh, so we are at to the features of uh, a drug that would make sense for us to try and get a license for so clearly we got to know that we can get a license for it but it also we need to make sure that for example in low and middle countries which is the countries that we serve that the health system is in place that for example there are adequate diagnostics adequate um staffing with adequate knowledge to make use of the drugs but primarily the question is can one of our licenses really benefit public health because that is the key question and that is what we are concerned with if it can and there is a patent on it that 
has quite a long time to expire and that that is the primary barrier to making it available in LMICs, then uh, all other things being equal, health systems being there, we will um, attempt to get a license for that and do what we've done so far. Um, so we're right still at the exploratory phase. Um, we're going to take a preliminary decision uh, in April as to what to look at. And yes, I'm hoping, and this is one of the reasons I, I took the job, that we will be able to give access to medicines right across the whole field of health to people who really need them. Okay, thank you. We have a question from uh, Rahul Devedi. Uh, he wants to know if uh, generic pharma companies are more supportive of voluntary licensing or the big pharma? Um, I think they're, they're both supportive in their separate ways. Mm -hmm. um, for generics, um, they get the opportunity to develop and, and sell drugs that, that are under patent and otherwise. Um, and as I said, for, for the originator companies, what you call big pharma, um, for them, it's a way of, of ensuring that their drugs are used by uh, as many people as possible, as well as making sure that they, they address this issue of access, because access is not going away as a demand. This mm -hmm. is only going to grow. And... The big pharmaceutical companies know they have to respond to that. And so, as I said, this is one way of, of ensuring that there is real access. So I think, I, I wouldn't say one more than the other. I'd say they're both supportive. Okay. Okay, thank you, Charles. Thank you very much. It was uh, really very, very informative, whatever you said. And uh, it has also given us, at least it has given me that passion for perseverance as you said in the beginning. Thank you very much. You're very welcome, Shoba. Thank, Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you.